Larna made me my own patriotic Corona mask. <laughs> Check it out. America, baby. <laughs> Well, in keeping with our social distancing requirements, I hope that you're sitting at least six feet from the screen and from anyone else in your household and that you're wearing your mask, of course. And uh, let me just uh, get a little refreshment before... That's not going to work, is it? <laughs> Actually, I don't think I need to wear this for class after all. Um, but that's the mask I just referred to there. And I thought I'd do something here at the start of class. Since I don't have you sitting there, I'm not looking out at you in your spots in the classroom. I thought I would show you what I am seeing. So I shot this clip. Uh, just a little while ago, and I'm going to try to edit it in here. So if this works correctly, I should fade out, and then you should be seeing what the classroom looks like. So this is what I am looking at here. <laughs> the room is kind of, kind of a mess right now. We've got our Bob Ross mug and bobblehead and here's the here's the room right now so it'll be nice when we have everyone back in their seats <laughs> Now, now, if that did not work correctly, then you just watched me staring here at the, at the camera and nothing happening, so I apologize. But if it did work correctly, you can see how differently we have the room set up uh, for the recording. So it's a little strange standing here teaching to a bunch of blankets hanging from the chairs and tables. But it is a great setup for recording this way. Let me mention something that happened before we jump back into this text from Luke chapter 4. I already recorded this class, but when I went up to my phone in the tripod there and I went to turn it off after class, it was off. Somehow it kicked off at about the seven minute mark and I just continued to teach the whole class and didn't realize it wasn't recording. And then I realized why it kicked off. George McInnes called me. I could see from my Apple Watch that it, George was calling and on my iPad over here. Well, I forgot to put the phone in airplane mode. And so when he called, it kicked the recording off. So uh, George, I'm recording this a second time because of you, my brother. But that's okay, you left me a very nice and encouraging mes message and I appreciate that. But now I'm recording this again, and by the way, that's why it isn't up in time for our Wednesday night class. So those who are watching later pr have no idea what I'm talking about, but normally we would have posted this for our Wednesday night class. But because of that glitch, we had to uh, wait and post it for, for the next day. So. Let's just jump right back into Luke chapter 4 here, where as we look at the purpose and themes of Luke, I gave a couple of key passages, and one of those is what is often called the programmatic passage in the Gospel of Luke. In chapter 4, when he went into the synagogue in his hometown in Nazareth, where he grew up, not where he was born, but where he grew up, and there was handed to him the scroll of Isaiah the prophet. And you remember it's very dramatic because the text says he opened the scroll to the place where it is written. And then he cited this text. And then he said, today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. Today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And well, we'll, we'll notice uh, the rest of the text in just a moment. Now, I was pointing some things out to you from this passage. And I didn't get a chance to... 
uh, finish what I was wanting to show you here. Whoop. So let's go back to it here. You notice we already looked at this idea where Jesus cites, I uh, proclaim good news to the poor and uh, proclaiming liberty to the captives. And in verse 19, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, allusions back to, to the Jubilee when slaves were set free and debts were forgiven and land was returned to its owners. So you have different metaphors used in scripture for salvation. And here Luke is showing us that Jesus is the fulfillment of this prophecy. He is the ultimate fulfillment of uh, the promise of liberation from captivity. So that's one metaphor that sin holds us captive and Christ sets us free. But there's another one here I wanted you to notice. Recovering of sight to the blind. We didn't really address that, but I wanted you to see that asterisk was terrible. I wanted you to see that this continues elsewhere in Luke's writings. For example, later, or rather, let's go back earlier first to the Benedictus, as it's called, from Luke chapter 1, where Zechariah, Zechariah is giving this praise, this exclamation of praise, and it's this beautiful little psalm there, if you will. And in that, we'll just jump into the middle of the text rather than trying to look at the whole context. In verse 77, look what he says, that um, John, the purpose of John was to prepare the way of the Lord and to give knowledge of salvation to his people. Notice salvation in the forgiveness of their sins. So in Luke's gospel, there is an emphasis on salvation being a matter of having our sins forgiven, that the Messiah would come and deliver us from our sins, that that is what we most need, is the guilt of our sins taken away. And so the Redeemer, the Messiah, the expectation in the mind of the Jews in Jesus' day is that he would come and bring a political deliverance, an earthly deliverance where the, he would drive out the Romans, he would drive out all their enemies and reestablish the nation of Israel as an earthly kingdom in power, perhaps like the glory days of Solomon. And so that's what they were thinking of about the, the kind of salvation that the Messiah would bring. And Luke shows over and over that this deliverance he is bringing is the forgiveness of our sins, deliverance from sins. Notice later in Luke part two, in the book of Acts, when Paul explains in Acts 26, when he explains when Jesus appeared to him and commissioned him to go to the Gentiles, the Lord said to him here, look at the text, Acts 26, 17, that the, the Lord said to Paul, delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you. Now, what, what was the purpose? You remember Acts is Luke part two. And in Acts, we pointed out, you find the church is the continuation and going out and taking the gospel to the world. That's the continuation of the work of Christ. Luke's gospel was all that Jesus began to do in the book of Acts shows what Jesus continued to do through the apostles and the church as they took the gospel to the Gentiles. Well, notice as we're doing that, even today, as that mission continues even today, the purpose of bringing the gospel to the world is expressed in this way, to open their eyes. So notice this idea of receiving our sight, that we're spiritually blind. So to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light. You see that language back in uh, Zechariah's words. There's this idea of those, verse 79, who sit in darkness uh, to give light to those who sit in darkness. I didn't comment on that earlier. So to, that they may turn from darkness to to light and from the power of Satan to God and may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. There's so much there, but I'm keying in here on how Luke talks about the forgiveness of sins over and over and he connects repentance to the forgiveness of sins. Luke's gospel emphasizes repentance. We'll mention that again, but 
uh, coming up here in the passage in Luke 24. But re remember Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. In Acts 3.19, repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out that your sins may be blotted out. So you can think of passage after passage. Acts 22, 16, this is all Luke's writing. Acts 22, 16, he tells us that the Lord uh, Ananias said to Saul, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. So that's something you see again and again in Luke's gospel. And that's why this passage here in chapter four, where Jesus is reading in the synagogue, it's such a fitting one to capture what his writing is going to be about. So notice after Jesus read that, look how dramatic this is, that uh, he rolled the scroll, verse 20, he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and he sat down. And so he's sitting down in order to teach those who are gathered there in the synagogue. And I love this little detail from Luke to show how tense the moment was, how, how dramatic the moment was. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. One translation says were fastened on him. And look at this announcement, absolutely staggering announcement. Verse 21, and he began to say to them today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I'm here. That passage is talking about in Isaiah. Isaiah was referring to uh, this idea we said of Jubilee, but also of the return of the captives who were carried away by Babylon. And this idea that that one day they, they would hear the message of uh, of being liberated, of being set free, the good news that would come that they're being set free and getting to return to the land. Well, Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of that. And Jesus shows, I am the one who is now here that the scriptures foretold to set you free. And of course, they rejoiced, right? And they carried him on their shoulders through town to celebrate that this hometown boy who grew up here is their savior. Hallelujah. No, <laughs> that's not what happened at all, as you know. They were offended. We don't have time to look at exactly why they were offended at what Jesus went on to say, but they took him out uh, to the edge of the hill on which the city was built and tried to throw him over and murder him right there on the spot. And it was not his hour, though, and so the Lord protected him. And, but they were trying to kill him even at that time. And so Luke moves this up, as we pointed out, and puts it, it's not in chronological order. We mentioned that it's in Mark's gospel and in Matthew's, but I didn't make clear that it's only mentioned there that he went to Nazareth and, and preached. It's not told in Matthew and Mark. We don't find the details of what he actually said in the synagogue and what happened. And so Luke, from his sources, he expands on that, tells us about what happened, and he moves the whole story up. It actually occurred later in Jesus' ministry, but he wants to put it at the start of his record of what Jesus did because it is representative of what Luke is going to tell us about our Savior. So remember that passage, an extremely important passage. But then another key text I said is at the end of the book in Luke 24. In verse 44, this is what you might call beginning in verse 44 through uh, through actually through verse 49. I think I listed earlier, I listed through verse, uh, let, me, let me check and make sure I gave you the right passage. I think I li listed through verse 47. Yeah, I, I, I have it through verse 47, but really you could say all the way to the end of verse 49. But this is essentially Luke's account of the Great Commission. And notice in the charge that Jesus gives him, very important, please hear me, on this church, hear the Lord on this. Let's pay attention to this. Here we find in Luke's gospel, and this is only in Luke's gospel, what Jesus told them to go preach as they bring the good news to the world. Well, what is it about? Notice he said in verse 44, uh, 
he said, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms must, there's that word that we already pointed out, you remember that uh, it's a key thought in Luke, day must be fulfilled. So then he opened their minds that they might understand the scriptures. And he said to them, verse 46, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer. There's that idea again, that this was a matter of God's will, that the Christ the Christ should suffer, the Messiah should suffer, and then on the third day rise from the dead, and that, and this is what I wanted to emphasize, repentance, notice what's it connected to? For the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem, taking it to all the nations, a key theme of Luke-Acts, being witnesses of the Lord, key in Luke-Acts, sending the promise of the Father of the power of the Holy Spirit. All of that is important in Luke-Acts. Those are emphases that we find in his gospel and in the book of Acts. But I want you to notice that we as the church, in taking the gospel to the world, are supposed to be proclaiming a message of repentance, that the Lord requires us to turn from our sin. John's gospel is the gospel of belief. It's sometimes called that. And so in John's gospel, you find that word believe or belief over and over again. You remember one of the key texts at the end of John, John 20, verses 30 and 31. We looked at that early on in the series. By the way, this is now the 30th class in this, in this series. 30 classes you're holding up very well and we're just now getting through this introduction to Luke but way back earlier we cited that text from John these things are written that you might what is it believe that you might believe and that's something we find over and over in John John 3:16 for God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son that who whoever believes in him. But in Luke, we find Luke wants to emphasize that what this belief should lead us to do is change our lives. And so he says, Jesus sent out the church. He sent out these apostles, and these are the marching orders for God's people through all the ages. It is to bring a message that calls people to change their lives to, based on their faith in Christ, repent of their sins so they can receive the forgiveness of their sins. So that's why I said that's another key text in the book. So, all right, all of that. We're at 17 minutes, but as I pointed out to you, and let me see if I could just show you this while we're, while we're doing this. I didn't plan to do this, so let me cross my fingers. But as I mentioned to you, you can be watching this at a faster speed, at you can, you can watch at 1.25 or 1.5, one and a half speed, or even 1.75 or double speed, and you can get through a class in a much shorter time. And that's the way I listen to, as I pointed out to you so much, um, so much that um, I, I listen to on YouTube, so many of the lectures and so many of the, so much of the teaching material, even in podcasts. But let me see if I can get this to uh, pull something up here. It's giving me all these suggestions. Let me go to my history and just pull up. Uh, here, here's Bob Ross. But, well, here's one of my classes. So there's the, there are those little dots. Whoop, it's still coming up. And, well, when I when I tell it to play the video, it actually, uh, I actually lose those little dots. You can't see them. So I'll, I'll have to tell, I'll just have to leave it to you to go and find those and uh, find, find where that little menu is and you can watch this on a faster speed. All right. So now I need to I need to change files in case you're joining us for the first time. I know those of you who've been in the class, you've heard me say this over and over. Forgive me. 
I need to mention it again for those who are new, but all of this material is available. All the things that you see on the board here, all of the boards, I call them, are available in PDF files that I have posted to a, a Google Drive folder, and I can give you a link to that. In fact, if, I might even put it in the comments down below. I can pin a comment to the top or in the description below the, the YouTube video. Right below that, you'll see a description of the content there, and I can put a link. I'll try to remember to put a link to it there, or you can contact me. I can give you that link, and I'd be happy to give you access to all of these, all of these boards. And the numbers of these files don't correspond with the class number. As I said, we're in class number 30, but I'm now opening the file that is number 18. So these will be posted for you. And I want to point out to you some very important material at the, at the, uh, that you can access at that folder. In fact, let me see if I pull that folder up, the Google Drive folder. Yes, okay. Um, you'll, you'll be able to find a file that I'm going to be referring to here in this particular file. I'm going to have that embedded inside of here, but it's available as a separate file. So you'll see what I'm talking about here in a moment. All right, enough about that. So we've looked at the historical context of Luke's gospel. And then we just finished the theme and purpose where we just looked at some of those key passages that capture that theme. All right, let's spend a few minutes talking about what's actually in his gospel. And then we'll talk about how it's presented when we look at the literary features. But first of all, before we look at the way Luke writes uh, what he does. Wow. <laughs> I'm recording this Wednesday night because, as I mentioned, the earlier recording didn't work. And so I had to kind of reset things and I actually came back up here to record it this evening. And so the bell went off. But it's going to go off again in five minutes, but we're only at the 21 minute mark. So you can bear with me. You can bear with me uh, longer than this next bell. The content and structure, what's actually in Luke's gospel? Now remember, here we've already talked about the synoptic problem, and I can refer you perhaps, perhaps again in the description below, I can put the video, the class number that you can go back to and see what we said about the synoptic problem that deals with the literary relationship between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They share a lot in common. And what I've told you, I believe, is the best answer to how, how we explain this literary relationship is Mark in priority, that Mark wrote first, all right? Mark wrote first, and that Matthew and Luke used Mark. Now, as we pointed out, almost all of Mark, 90%, is in Matthew. Now, I noticed when I went back to get this, this is from, you've already seen this if you've been in the class, and this is from when our discussion of the synoptic problem. I had the wrong number here. I think I had 500-something, and 500, if you do the math, is not... 90% of 661 verses. Again, when I went to preacher school to become a gospel preacher, I was told there would be no math. So anyway, I wanted to correct that. So almost all of Mark is in Matthew, but only half of Mark is in Luke. And so there's a lot more material in Luke that is unique to Luke's gospel. And then notice there, is, there are about 250 verses that are common to, um, to Matthew and Luke. And what do we call those? Remember, the material that's common to Matthew and Luke that isn't in Mark. What did we say that is called? Ah, uh, yes, it is Q. <laughs> Q. Don't be alarmed. When we refer to Q, it's just the first letter in the German word quelle, which means source. And it's just a term that's used 
to say that Matthew and Luke were apparently drawing from some common source because they have this body of material that's almost identical, but which they vary to suit their purposes. And so I think uh, there apparently was some other source that we, that we refer to as Q because we don't have that record, but it's apparent when you compare Matthew and Luke. And so We've talked about that, and this chart here I'm bringing back up again. I just wanted to show you, and there's a lot of information in all this, but just notice that Mark only has, let me switch here, Mark only has 31 verses that are unique to his gospel. Because as we said, almost all of it is in Matthew, half of it is in Luke. Uh, Matthew is, is, of course, much longer and has 300 verses that are unique to his gospel that you don't find in Mark or Luke or, of course, or John. Uh, here we're comparing the synoptics because John is almost all new material that isn't in the synoptics. And then Luke, in Luke, Luke's longer than Matthew, not, not substantially so, but Luke has the most material that is unique to him, and we call that material L. If I go back to this, Mark, the stuff in Mark, we call Mark. The stuff in Matthew, M, you'll see reference to an M passage or the M material. That means the stuff that's unique to Matthew. Q, the stuff that's in Matthew and Luke. And then L, L is the uh, stuff that is just in Luke's gospel. So what about this L material? Well, this is some, the L material, and again, there is a, this is what I was talking about earlier, clumsily trying to explain this. These documents that you're going to see right here, these next several pages, they're all in a single PDF file that's available at the Google Drive folder, Intro to the Gospels. Ah, see? See, that would be when normally we would be finishing and you would not have to endure. Well, actually, you know, I usually go over the bell anyway. We're only at 26 minutes and 18 seconds. Well, that, that's not counting the little part I had at the, that I inserted there. So we're a, little, we're a couple minutes longer than that, actually. But this is all available, and I want you to have this material. If we, if we were having class with everyone here tonight, I would have this all printed out so that everyone could be looking at it and you'd be able to see it because I know this is small, the text is small and you can't really see it. You can see it a little bit when you're sitting in the classroom, but it's hard to see on the video, so forgive me. But you can go to that file and, and pull it up. And, and let me see, uh, you can tell what it looks like here um, at that folder. Right, okay, here it is. Let me do this. Let me show you. If you go to that folder, this is my other iPad here, you'll see this. Let me put this the wide way so that it fills the screen. Okay, and then <laughs> it's hard to tell, but one of these in the bottom left there, Luke, material for the, go the class. And then see, you can just scroll through all of this on your phone or on your tablet or on your computer. This is some really, really good information. Well, that, that's what we're looking at right now. Let me go back to see if I can go back to my... Good. All right, that, was, that worked better than earlier, that total fail when I tried to go over to the YouTube video and show you how to increase the speed of the, the playback speed. What are some things that are unique to Luke's gospel? We've already talked about this right from the beginning. The, the story of Jesus' birth even though Matthew has a birth narrative, we know, you know Luke has the shepherds coming and the announcement of the angels to the shepherds and the shepherds coming. And, and uh, Luke is the one that has the story of Jesus as a boy in the temple and all of that, and the appearance of the angel to Mary. We're going to talk about that eventually here. Um, but what are some other things that are well known and that we know are unique to Luke's gospel? Well, let me... Uh, increase some of this a little bit. Well, for example, some of the things I think of are the, the, some of the parables of Jesus that are the most well-known and some of the most striking parables of the Lord are only in Luke's gospel. They're L material. Like, think of some of these parables. The parable, if you notice here, 
You have, for example, the parable of the Pharisee and the publican in Luke 18. And you have the rich man and Lazarus, if that is a parable, in Luke chapter 16. And then the parable of the lost coin, the, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost boy. In Luke chapter 15, the prodigal son, in other words, and the elder son. And then the, uh, I already mentioned the Pharisee and the tax collector, the parable of the persistent widow and the unjust judge. And then, of course, you have the, um, the, the, the parable of the unjust steward. These are things that are well known from Jesus' gospel. And I just preached on the resurrection appearance that's only in Luke's gospel where he appeared to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. That was in a sermon I did this past Sunday. And Luke refers to the ascension of Jesus at the end of his gospel. That's unique to the gospels if we take the short ending of Mark, and that's something we've already talked about. And I've listed here, in this chart, we find what, and I've got to go back to my timer here so I keep track of my time. We've listed some of the things that, well, we've listed everything that he leaves out from Mark's gospel. And the, if you look at this gospel, the italicized uh, references, those are things that, that Luke leaves out that are, all, that are in Matthew. So in other words, they're things that, that only Luke chose to leave out. Um, and you see a column here where much of the material that Luke leaves out falls into a category called either the great omission or the little omission. We'll explain what that was hopefully here in a minute if we keep moving along. But that's an interesting reference. You see where he left out some of these things like Jesus walking on the water. That's not in Luke's gospel, even though it's in both uh, Mark. Notice Matthew did not omit that. It's in both Mark and Matthew. So that gives you an idea that will we'll kind of show you the things that Luke didn't feel he needed to include because, of course, he includes many other things that aren't in Matthew or Mark. Things that he includes that are in Matthew, this Q material that we keep talking about. Let me unlock this so I can make it bigger. Uh, some of the most famous statements of Jesus that you find in Matthew are also in Luke, like the Beatitudes, but Luke, in Luke's account, they're expanded on and they're a little different. And the, the, the teaching on loving your enemies and things of that kind that are well known, you can look through that. That's part of that document. But let me give you an example where when he includes something that's in Matthew, you still see, though, Luke modifying it. You remember we just mentioned an emphasis in Luke is repentance, right? Well, when here, when he talks about uh, rebuking and forgiving sin from Matthew 18, you remember that where you take a brother with you and if you won't, you take two or three with you and if you won't hear, you tell it to the church. If you won't hear the church, let him be to you like a, uh, a tax collector and a, and a Gentile. Well, when Luke, you have just a few verses here that talk about that dealing with a brother. But in Luke's account, Luke says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And it's only in Luke you find this. If he repents, repentance. Luke wants you to know forgiveness is connected to repentance. If we want to be forgiven, we have to turn away from that sin. So he says, uh, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And then here's the condition. If he repents, forgive him. A lot of people forget that when they talk about Jesus' teaching on forgiveness. Now, let's look at this here. Very important to understand some things about Luke's redactions of Mark. That is, here we're going to see that when he takes, remember Matthew and Mark apparently, I'm sorry, Matthew and Luke, they have a copy of Mark before them. And so we saw Matthew includes just about everything that's in Mark. Luke, only half of Mark, 
And when he does include things from Mark, he makes some changes. That's what we mean by redactions. Again, it's important for you to have this document, and I encourage you to study it, to look through it. Some great information here. Luke's redactions of Mark's gospel. Let's think about how he modifies, whoops, how he modifies and um, adapts Mark's material. So as far as, first of all, as far as organization goes, okay, and I know this is hard to see, so I'm just going to assume you can pull this document up or print it out or be able to look at it somehow, but I'm gonna, I'll read some of it. Please bear with me, but I think this is interesting, as I often say, but it's important. So he moves things around. We already pointed out he moved up the story of Jesus preaching in Nazareth because he sets it at the beginning of Jesus' ministry to set the tone or the stage. And then, interestingly, he takes the dispute that the disciples have over who's the greatest and connects that to the, to the Last Supper that he has with them when he instituted the Lord's Supper. And that something, the reasons that he might have done that are something that we don't have time to go into right now. But uh, notice he abbreviates some things. He omits from Mark's stories things that he might consider either insignificant or, or inappropriate. So, for example, and Matthew leaves this out as well, uh, but, but this is interesting. Uh, I keep saying that, forgive me. But, but uh, if the writer of this gospel in Acts is, as we've suggested, the Luke that... Paul refers to in Colossians 4 as one of his companions, and he refers to him as Luke. You remember the beloved physician. Now notice then that Luke leaves off the comment about the incompetence of physicians, the woman who spent all of her living on doctors and was not any better. So, uh, yeah, we can see why Luke might leave that out then. That's uh, not something he doesn't feel a need to, to include. Uh, he leaves out a couple of other things there you, you can notice. As far as sophistication goes, he leaves off Luke's use of the historical present. Now we said, or Mark rather, we said that's something Mark uses that makes his gospel quite vivid. The historical, the historical present, you remember that's where you're talking about something that already happened, but you're using the present tense as though it's happening right then and there. And we do that as well. If I wanted to tell you that I went to the store today and, and I might say, so, so I go to the store or in New York, you know, we'd say, so I go to the store and I says to the guy, I says to him, I go, that's the way, yeah, that's the way some of my uh, family and friends talk back, back home. So I says to the guy, I says to him, I goes, so I look and I see there's no toilet paper there. So I says to the guy, I says to him, I go, you know, there's still no toilet paper. Why are people still hoarding the toilet paper? And he says to me, the guy says to me, he goes, so I'm using the present tense there. Instead of saying he said, past tense, I, um, I am saying he says to me. All right, for look at, instead of me saying I went to the store, I say, so I go to the store and I'm in the store and I see on the shelf there's no toilet paper. All right, let's, do, let's go to Luke's gospel, a very dramatic use of the historical present is when Jesus is crucified, you remember, instead of the past tense, instead of Mark saying, and they crucified him, he says, and they crucify him. Present tense, and it seems to me that usage is so that you're seeing it happen in the present right before you. It's as though Mark is taking you by the hand and leading you back to Calvary and he's turning your eyes toward it and he's saying, look, and they crucify him. It's very dramatic. But Luke's concerns are different and because he's writing in a loftier Greek and a more polished, sophisticated style of Greek for, it appears, originally a more educated Greek uh, class of Greek people, that uh, he leaves off some of these, like in Mark's gospel, you'll have a lot of ands, and then immediately, and he did this, and Andy did that, and immediately this happened, and immediately that happened. And there's a couple places where 
Luke leaves those out, well, it's important in certain places for Luke to leave them out because it can mislead you as to what's happening. And Luke is trying to be a little bit more precise and a little bit more accurate. Or let me just say, instead of misleading you, uh, Luke wants to clarify places where Mark keeps putting that in there because he's his gospel is a gospel of action and he's taking us through. It's like the action movie of the synoptics. And so Luke doesn't need that in his gospel. So he reduces that and changes. There's some other references to the way he changes the Greek into a better, more grammatically correct and a little bit more polished Greek. Things that aren't as accurate as Luke wants them to be, he's concerned with giving us a historically accurate account. And so where Mark says King Herod, Luke points out Herod, that he's Herod the Tetrarch, which is technically more accurate. He leaves out the problematic reference to Abiathar, Abiathar, rather the high priest. And that's something we don't have time to discuss right now. Now, as far as contextual relevance, because he is writing likely for a more culturally diverse audience throughout the Roman Empire. He eliminates Mark's use of the, uh, Mark's inclusion of the Aramaic expressions that we talked about that uh, Matthew also uh, excludes most of those. He leaves off some things where, uh, or rather he includes some framing of accounts by giving us precise historical information so that we can nail down what's happening in the context of world history because he wants to show us the he wants to show us the broad historical context and I think because he's presenting to us Jesus as the center of history Jesus steps on the stage of human history and Luke tells us exactly who is reigning in what place when it was and so you'll see that often this is uh this is a little a little uh, interesting thing where Mark refers to village. Uh, Luke will often change that to the Greek word polis for, or city. Again, he's writing to a more metropolitan audience and not so they, he changes that word um, to city because his uh, readers, his first readers wouldn't be in, a, in as rural of a setting. And even the monetary value of coins, I think we mentioned this once already, whereas Mark will refer to the more humble uh, copper, well, Luke changes that to silver. It seems that Luke, again, is originally writing to those who are more prosperous, and it would make more sense for his readers to refer to silver. Now, this last thing right here on character portrayal of, first of all, of Jesus and then of the disciples, whoops, apologize for all those distractions with the uh, tools here, the disciples of Jesus, and then the uh, Jesus family here. All right, let's think about this for a minute. Uh, he wants to show us Jesus in a little bit different light. Of course, he's giving us a unique portrait of Jesus. So he leaves out, among many other things that are distinctive about the way he pictures Jesus. He leaves out from Mark things that seem to imply a lack of ability on Jesus' part. Uh, we've mentioned some things along that line already, so let me just go to this one here. The emotions that Mark includes of Jesus showing pity or being angry, uh, sh expressing wonder or indignation, Luke leaves those things out, those kinds of human emotions. And he leaves out stories that might be somewhat violent or, or details from the stories like the overturning of the tables and anything that might make Jesus appear similar to the magicians of that time he drops. For example, the healing of the blind man and the deaf mute in Mark 7 and 8. You remember that involved Jesus using spit and anointing his eyes and putting his fingers in his ears, using what appear to be incantations. Well, Luke doesn't want anything close to that, Jesus appearing at all, or anything close to the kinds of charlatans and magicians who would uh, heal in manner similar to that. So he just wants, he leaves all that out. Now, the, his portrayal of the disciples, and I know we've gone past what would normally be a 45-minute class, but 
There's no bell ringing now, and there's nobody here to stop me, and I don't have a classroom th full of people who are leaving as I talk, and then people coming in and turning the lights out and locking up the building and all of that. So I want to just finish this here, if I could. The disciples of Jesus, again and again, we've said, this is one of the distinctive features of Mark's gospel. He portrays them the most negatively by far. In Mark's gospel, they seem just unfailingly stupid, that they just don't get a lot of things that Jesus is saying. Well, but in, in Luke's gospel, that's mitigated or muted. For example, Peter's denial, and that's predicted by Jesus in all of the synoptic accounts. And Peter's denials are in John too, uh, John's gospel as well. And the disciples falling asleep. We find that in Mark as well. But it's muted or explained in, in the sense that Jesus tells Peter about his denial that... Well, uh, Peter, Satan asked to have you so that he might sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you so that your faith won't fail. So, you know, Satan is involved in drawing Peter away, so that that's included. Or at times where the disciples lack understanding, they're unperceptive, there's, there's an attribution of that or an explanation of that in Luke, I should say, where they're, we're told that, that it was hidden from them. It was concealed from them. You remember in the text we just looked at in Luke 24, Jesus opened their eyes. He opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures rather. And in the encounter with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, their eyes were closed or hidden so they couldn't recognize them. And then their eyes were open. So you have this idea of things being concealed in whatever way, in whatever sense, and then, then their eyes are open. Then they're revealed by God, by the action of God somehow. And so Luke doesn't want to portray them as just being, as we said earlier, as just being stupid or dense or unable to get the point. He explains that, well, these things were hidden from them until they were further explained by Jesus. We'll come back to that in a moment. And then Jesus' family coming to seize him and say that he's lost his mind, he leaves that out. And when he says, who is my true family? Uh, he lessens that, the, uh, the contrast with his earthly family so that it doesn't it appear to be that he's just sort of denying his human family and saying, you who keep the word of God, you're my family, you're my brothers and sisters. It's worded a little bit differently. These are subtle differences, but they're worth noting. I encourage you to study that. And look at that and see how that's developed when you look at all of this together. But why might it be that Jesus has this more, or rather Luke has this more positive portrayal of the disciples? This would be a good thing to end on because this would be an, an encouraging thought for us. Well, you remember this is Luke's gospel is part one. And what is he telling us about in Luke part two in Acts, how Jesus empowers these same disciples to be his inspired ambassadors and to go out and take his message to the world. So you remember Luke points out that in his prologue to Acts that this gospel is all that Jesus began to do and teach. And in the book of Acts, he's telling us what Jesus continued to do but it was through these disciples. So Luke wants to portray these disciples in as uh, these are men in training who are going to be going out and being used in a powerful way by Jesus to take the message to the world. And so, yes, they had faults. And yes, they didn't understand things at times. Yes, they argued among themselves and were, were still thinking about uh, prideful positions and all of that. But Luke mutes that, he lessens that, and gives us a far more positive portrayal of the disciples because they, they, he wants us to see that these men are being equipped and they're going to be competent and they're going to go out and be used in a great way by the Lord. So think of it as perhaps if you were called upon to give a reference to someone who's applying for a job and you might know some faults that that person has, but those faults wouldn't 
necessarily keep them from doing well in this particular job. So you would likely in your job recommendation say some positive things and highlight the attributes that your friend has that would make him useful for the job. And you'd probably tend to downplay his faults and you would tend to speak more and emphasize more the things that are positive about him. And so we see that with the disciples here in Luke's account. And that, that, that encourages me because you have this negative portrayal of the disciples in Mark's account. And there, there are theological reasons we can surmise. We can see perhaps why Mark wanted to do that when we look at Mark's gospel. But we can see in Luke's gospel, he wants to portray them as despite all of their faults, and the things that they, where they stumble and err, despite all of that, the Lord's going to use them in a great way. And we need to think about ourselves that way. The Lord is continuing to act. As you look at the book of Acts, what Jesus does through the early church, through first the apostles and then through the church, he's continuing to do through his church today and through you and me. And despite our flaws despite our shortcomings, the Lord can still work in us to do great things in this community. And His presence can be felt. And it might seem sometimes that we're very limited. It might seem that we're not making much of a difference in the world. Or we might tend to think that because of our flaws, the Lord can't do that much through us. But no, no, no. Remember that it's the power of God that works in us. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 and so uh, the Lord can glorify his name through you and through me today in a great way, despite our flaws and shortcomings. And that's something we've talked about before when we've uh, looked at this introduction to the Gospels. And I hope that encourages you again today as we think that what we're doing is important. What we're doing as the disciples of the Lord, as his church today, it matters. It's making a difference in the world, even if we don't always see it or always understand it. And we should thank God for that and rejoice in that. All right. So then we'll, we'll continue to look at the content. Not, not going to spend much more time on that so that we can move into the literary features. Oh, it's going to be so exciting. It's going to be so good. So you need to stay tuned. We want you we want you to uh, look forward to the rest of this study here. I'm going to try to uh, do this here if I can. There. So I can uh, step toward the camera a little bit without the light shining in my face. So I'm glad that you could be with us. And may God bless and keep you. And we look forward to being together with you again next time, Lord willing.